is for all of us to go on this journey to seek the truth about ourselves and discover ourselves and discover the universal absolute truth. And, and with us, we have our incredible Chaitanya Charan. So I call him Chaitanya because he's, he's awakened his spiritual consciousness and he shares that with the whole world. He has published many books, I think almost a dozen books. He is an accomplished author and he's a spiritual scientist, a material scientist, and he combines all of that together and he's with us. So thank you, Chaitanya Prabhu. And then we have Radha Priti. I call her Radha because it's easier. And another incredible soul because she has been on this journey for seven years. And, and within those seven years, she's dove very deep into the practice of bhakti and studying the Bhagavad Gita and now sharing with others in Pittsburgh. So this is it. So thank you so much. And we'll continue. And I hand it over to Chaitanya Charan, Chaitanya Prabhu. Thank you for that introduction. So I'll be using my... Oh, I, I want to please, excuse me, I forgot to uh, invite Chintamani. And you see Claudia Chintamani, another beautiful soul, part of the leading team in Connecticut, along with with uh, with Keshavi, another one of the pillars there. So thank you, Chintamani. Go ahead, Chintamani. Thank you. So, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. 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 So we are discussing on the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, we will be discussing today the second chapter, the first chapter we discussed earlier yesterday. And there we discussed broadly the theme of how life can be a battlefield. And when that happens, what do we do? How do we function? So in that connection, today we'll, I'll continue and we'll discuss based on the second chapter, but we'll focus primarily on two verses from the second chapter. So this is the second chapter, verses 2 and thir 13 and 14. So I'll read the Sanskrit, if you don't mind to share it. So I'm people can just it. hear. Sanskrit sounds really sweet. Dehi no sminyatha dehe komaram yovanam jara tatha dehantara praptir Dhiras tatrana muhyati. Rather pretty. Please, would yes. you mind to read the English? Uh, yeah. Uh, as the embodied soul continually passes in this body from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. The self realized soul is not bewildered by such a change. What is the first line of the next verse? Matras parishas to conteya, she toshna sukha dukhada, agama paino nityas, namstatik sashwabharata. Yes. O oh, son of Kunti, the non permanent appearance of happiness and distress and their disappearance in due course are like the appearance and disappearance of winter and summer seasons. They arise from sense perception. Oh, Sayana okay. of Barta, and one must learn to tolerate them without being disturbed. Yes, thank you. So we are going ahead on our journey through the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita has 18 chapters. And 
we will be covering one one key theme from each chapter so right now we are in chapter 2 which is among the longer chapters in the gita this is 72 verses now the first chapter was basically theme you discuss as life becomes a battlefield so arjuna is literally on a battlefield and here we also in our lives we discussed how we can sometimes face battlefield like situations and what we can do at those times so in addressing arjuna's question krishna is making a statement over here so i'll just quickly visually explain both the verses and then we'll discuss the implication of those verses as applies to our life so 213 essentially what is saying it is that that in our life if we consider b to be birth d to be death we see basically the challenge which arjuna is facing is that you now what's real what really matters what because he has to fight a war in which much that is dear to him many people whom who are dear to him he has to fight against them he's going to lose them so to understand what really matters so krishna addresses us different question what really persists what really exists continuously what well, and that and that is the second question that comes from it and answering that krishna is basically taking arjuna on a journey say we are small we grow young you know we start stooping downwards and then eventually even in this life we become old and we die so now when we go through these phases this this could be in these phases we ourselves go through these phases but we identify that it is i there is a part of me which is changing that is okay i was small i have become young i become older but there is a part of me if this is me then the part of me that is changing is very much there and this is just representational image that in terms of size but beyond that changing is okay i was young i was old but there is something unchanging so what is that unchanging that's what krishna is drawing our attention to so to what really matters it depends on what really persists what is it that is going to be unchanging about us is there something unchanging and krishna uses the word deha that is the body the body is changing but the dehi what is within the body what is embodied that is unchanging and that is the soul so that is the atma as the word is used in sanskrit now this is 213 and then the implication of this that is given in 214 is that if we understand that part of us is there is a part of us that is changing a part of us that is unchanging then the implication would be that we can learn if change and non change is using word non change as a specific word over here to highlight the contrast constancy so then if we have a foundation of non change of constancy of steadiness then the change it can become bearable if everything it can become tolerable so when there is a foundation of something unchanging then okay so oh, my job has changed but my, my i lost my job but my family is still there with me okay i i lost this friend but this friend is still there with me you know i've lost my i lost my wealth but my ability is still there with me i can always get another job so whenever change occurs we need something unchanging to hold on to and to the extent we have something unchanging to hold on to to that extent we can actually be steady we can tolerate the change so if you consider this to be an ocean in the ocean sometimes there are waves always there are waves but sometimes there might be a monster wave it is just and if we are struggling to be here so how do we protect ourselves from the monster wave we need something that is unchanging something that won't be affected by the waves something like an anchor if we hold on to the anchor then 
we won't be so shaken by the wave that comes. The wave may come and hit us, but it, it, it can shake us away. But if we hold on to the anchor, if we come forward and hold on to the anchor and we grip the anchor tightly, then we will be safe. So Krishna is saying over here, the implication can of... We zoom back. Can we zoom in a little bit more, Prabhu? Okay. If zoom you go in. up a little bit, because I think I think it's it's really nice. We were talking yes. about the difference yes, yes. between body and the soul. Yeah. And we were talking about Deha and Dehi. Yes. And I think it's different. Uh, uh, thought that I had on that was Deha is body and Dehi is consciousness. So one is the matter and, and the spirit. So there is there's a conscious component that activates the body. So I thought that yes. was another... Uh, when 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 you were presenting this changing and unchanging, it is simply matter that is changing, and the consciousness is the constant uh, activating principle that makes and that is uh, the permanent aspect of our being. Yes, that is true. Now the way the Gita explains it is: say this is the soul, this is the body. Now, what comes out from the soul? is the stream of consciousness. So consciousness is more like an energy in the vision of the Gita. And this energy comes from a source. That source is the soul. So consciousness and, and, and a soul are related. It's just like if I have this, if I have a flashlight on my phone. Now, now there is this beam of light coming from the flashlight. So that beam of light is like the consciousness. And the point from which that beam is originating, that is the soul. So, Chetana is the characteristic of the soul. Consciousness exists, but consciousness has a locus. Consciousness has a grounding or a starting point. So, that's how the Gita explains. Yes, what is unchanging is consciousness. But, you know, another way to understanding it is that there is, with respect to consciousness also, there is the source of consciousness. And, uh, and there is a content of consciousness. If you see the content of consciousness does keep changing. And that actually therein lies our hope. Sometimes a person is say, addicted to a, something like alcohol. And the primary content of their consciousness is alcohol. And that's what defines them, characterizes them as alcoholic. But that content can change. So when we talk about expanding our consciousness, elevating our consciousness. So this is what we can change. But this is, this is something which is unchanging. That is the ground of our being. It's very, it's very interesting because when you're saying this, it reminds me of this beautiful verse in the Srimad Bhagavat Quran where uh, Dhruva Maharaj is, is actually uh, explaining how when the prana enters the body, then his senses are activated. So it was the the, the, the supreme divine within the oxygen molecules that actually activate and keep and sustain this body. It is not the oxygen in itself. So you're saying the same thing with the soul and the consciousness, right? That's a good example. Yes. Very nicely put. Thank you. Yes, it's consciousness is the activating energy. But in general, energy is what is visible, but there is an energetic source mm -hmm. that may be overlooked. It's like we might see the energy of a car and, and it is moving very fast. And now the car's visible parts are seen, but the energetic source is the engine from which the part is moving. It's a crude example, but the point is energy is much more easy to perceive but we understand that energy has to have a reservoir, a source. Radha Priti is uh, in her nuclear engineering background. Maybe yeah. she, she can give us some uh, some nuclear energy uh, metaphors and explanations to understand it from that angle. Uh, I, I don't know that I have anything that, that intelligent to say. I was just thinking about how in my own life, like, I'm going through a big transition of life right now. And 
how this connection to source is really the only thing that keeps me grounded in life. Like if I didn't have that, I don't think I would be able to, to like ride these waves out. And and I know because in past experience, when I've had big transitions and I've had big waves, I've turned to things like th that brought me down, like unhealthy relationships or alcohol, things that just like completely b bring me lower. And what I've, ex what I've experienced in this particular transition is the more that I connect to source, um, the more stable that I feel. And then, and then the decisions that I'm making as a result of that are bringing me up. And so I'm just so grateful because I, I know exactly what this is like. If source isn't there, like in that box you made where there's the changing and the non-changing, if, if you don't have any sense of non-changing, because everything in this material world is constantly changing. There, for me, anyway, it, there was like no hope. It was like, and then, and then everything I'm, all the decisions I'm making lead to to more instability, more instability, and and there's just no way up from there. So I just was appreciating this analogy. That's not nuclear engineering for you, but <laughs> but isn't it? That's isn't, it isn't it in science? Isn't it in science that they have where every seven years the body is changing? It's almost like a completely new person. Yeah. it's It depends on what level of the body the analysis that we do. You could say the cells, re cells rejuvenate after a particular period of time. We go further down to below the cells. There are parts of the cells. They rejuvenate a particular amount of time. But the key thing is well take the exit so the exact duration can vary for different things but the key principle is that things keep changing and even earlier it was thought that the brain doesn't change but now even the brain cells get rejuvenated so that's why it raises some very serious questions about identity if you consider the constant change that is happening that even if i had a car is. if i had a car and every single part of the car was replaced and would it still be the same car? Well, you could say yes, but what makes it same? You could say it's my car and that's why it is the same. But then you are not the car, isn't it? So like that our body keeps changing, but what is it that is an unchanging element within it? And that is our sense of i that comes from the soul. Can we talk a little about how, like for me anyway, I come from like a Christian background. So coming into this philosophy and trying to wrap my head around transmigration of the soul, it seems it seems a little bit out there at first, like a, a little bit hippie-like. So how would you explain you. that, Chitan Shram Prabhu, to like somebody who comes in from a Christian background and is like, that's crazy. Okay. Well, two things. Thank you for bringing this up. We could, with respect to the idea of the soul, there are many conceptions, but I could put them as a as a pendulum. One idea, this is the broad, the material idea, material idea is it doesn't exist at all. This is the, this theory find it very difficult to explain where consciousness comes from. They claim it comes from the brain somehow, but the brain is basically made of the same elements biologically and physically speaking as every other part of the body. So how does how does matter start experiencing matter? Suddenly develop the ability to experience matter. That is something which it can't explain. So this is. This is one problem. Now, the other theory is the idea that it doesn't, this is the broadly the Abrahamic idea, the Christian idea, doesn't exist separate from the body. Now, they accept the idea of the soul, but their idea is the soul and the body are intricately related and they cannot be separated. And this idea comes from, uh, to some extent, from uh, this idea comes from and is reinforced the idea of resurrection. So Jesus, after he was crucified, he said, was seen by several people and he was seen the same bodily form that he had. 
and then the, the from there the belief has arisen that just as jesus was resurrected in the same bodily form he we all will be resurrected in the same bodily form so that's it, that the person and the body the soul and the body although the soul is accepted the soul and body is said to be this are uh, not separate in themselves now when we start coming up with that idea that leads to a lot of questions which are difficult to answer Let's say for example if a person dies then that person will be resurrected with their body that's the that's the rationale for burial now when we bury the body uh, actually the body gets destroyed within a few days it's not there at all so burial doesn't really preserve the body but that is the ritual which says okay the body is buried and the body will be resurrected but then it the body is destroyed still in spite of burial but even if we assume that it is like that okay the body will be resurrected god will somehow resurrect the same body but then the problem comes up which body will be resurrected because what we might just call as growth it is a significant change sometimes people play this game with their if they are they are in their middle age 40 50 60 they might bring their school photo school group photo and ask can you spot me and sometimes it's easy to spot sometimes it's quite difficult to spot so if the body is going to be resurrected which body is going to be resurrected is the body that the person died in is it the person that was was a child when the person was a youth let me say if the person was died at the age of 80 and they were uh, that person was dysfunctional for 10 years well if the 80 year old body is resurrected is that going to be like heaven for to live in 80 year old body for the rest of one's life say no no you'll be resurrected in a youthful body okay if that is the case what about somebody who died before youth they died when the ch- a child died when they was just say 7 or 8 or 10 so which body will be resurrected at that time so the idea of bodily resurrection leads to a huge amount of problems so say if a husband and wife were there a couple were there and now the the husband died when he was 60 and the wife died when she was maybe 25 in 30 youth so which age body will be resurrected So the point is that this idea of saying the soul and the body are not are the same, it leads to a lot of both theological and com- practical problems, and that's why the the Abrahamic conception of heaven is almost like a perpetual family reunion, where all your lost ancestors, lost uh, deceased relatives and ancestors, they are going to be there. So the no, in the v- Vedic tradition we have a similar concept where. we all go to the eternal kingdom the spiritual sky where we all live happily ever after eternally in the company of the divine yes the the, diff- the the point i'm talking about is that it's the same bodily form that so my grandfather will be like my grandfather and mm-hmm. that's how i recognize my grandfather will be grandfather that the, the point is that the soul has its own form so i'll address this point so in between these two conceptions is that the soul exists through the body so we live through our body just like we drive through our car and while we have it it's important but it is not essential to our being this is my car can i have one car and i can replace 10 parts of the car and still the car remains the same and the car becomes irretrievably irrecoverably damaged then i i just get a new car and i still i can keep moving in the same direction so in fact the idea of reincarnation and transmigration there are two terms here so reincarnation sometimes the two terms are used interchangeably and transmigration what they refer to is normally the idea is that this is life birth and death and then it's over materialist if it's a materialistic world view then it's over forever if it's a spiritual if it's a, a christian world view then you will be resurrected at the second coming of jesus whenever that is but the the vedic idea is that there is birth there is death and then again there is birth and again there is death and like this it goes on 
and parallelly while this is happening what can or should be happening is the consciousness is evolving the consciousness evolves towards a higher understanding of life and its purpose so now this journey from one body to another is called as transmigration so it's migration but trans trans means it's a far far bigger migration simply from one place to another it's a transfer from one body to another and then the entry into this particular body so when this journey ends and the person enters into this body this is called reincarnation reincar car reincarnation is in car carnais flesh so to come into so to enter into flesh to come again in re means again so to come again in flesh so the two are related so both transmigration and reincarnation are integral to the vedic idea with the understanding of the soul and this understanding is that we as souls have gone through many lifetimes and we are evolving and this actually makes helps it reconciles with our observed reality our observed reality is that we all different people have different consciousness there are different levels in their spiritual evolution some people they are very spiritually inclined some people need time to even recognize there is something something spiritual in life so i was thinking so just i come to this point if this were the only if this were the only life we had then how would we explain the difference not just differences in terms of uh, material differences why are some people wealthy why are some people poor but even spiritual level differences so both become explicable by considering multiple lifetimes but otherwise they they just make it seem that the whole universe is working arbitrarily and some people are lucky and some people are unlucky and if we accept a god then that god is arbitrary yes kida ji i think if you go up on the chart where the pendulum is yeah this the conception of the soul the, the knowledge that we have determines actually almost the the narrative that the world that we live in like if you look at the abrahamic concept doesn't exist separate from the body this concept is so prevalent in the world that it almost uh, supersedes uh, all aspects of our life and it filters into our uh into our psychology into our into our biology into the environment and all aspects of our lives maybe we could uh dive a little bit more into that because you know on one hand we don't exist at all and then there's soul exist through the body and then this concept that you know the body is the essence and because of that uh concept so much effort is made by science and 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 technology to enhance and 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 try to uh, optimize the lifespan and and the enjoyment that is available through this body yes a uh, good point thank you so there is this whole uh, what is often called as anthropocentrism that we human beings are special because within the abrahamic christian conceptions the point here is not to criticize any religion it is just to understand the teachings and where they lead us so anthropocentrism is that humans are the center of the universe now this uh, has in many ways led to the environmental crisis because the whole idea is that the uh, environment is meant for us for the taking all living beings exist for us so, so now within the just go a little bit more technical within the christian conception they have christian conception of the soul they have three three kinds of souls which is a little funny there are vegetative souls which are present in plants and animals then there are sentient souls which are present sorry this is present only in plants sentient souls are present in animals and they have what is called as a rational soul that is present in humans and their idea is that these three are categorically different and only the rational souls which are present in humans 
are capable of knowing god and so deliverance salvation is only for these these souls in the human body they don't call it souls in the human body they call it human souls so this also leads to the entire ecosystem the entire flora and the fauna of the world just becomes an incidental backdrop for the central 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 plot line of human redemption so it leads to a very negligent and uh, often uh, self serving exploitative view of everything else so that is uh, one major the environmental problem environmental problems now we cannot really blame any particular hot but system for it but this, this is significantly contributing to that a question on this for clarification purpose this is the the christian conception right but yes. in in my understanding of the teachings of jesus this is not his view of the world because i in my understanding maybe i i i'm happy to be corrected but he was a compassionate loving soul towards all living beings his consciousness was at a very very high level so so i think we should differentiate between you know his personal teachings what he really is and was versus yeah. what came after him that's a very good point see if you consider one is the bible and the bible by here i'm referring to primarily the christian bible is the hebrew bible also but the bible mostly is ethical teachings and stories and say jesus like the gospel that is stories and life stories so what happened was that over subsequent generations so and like you said there are very uh, very good values about kindness and compassion and forgiveness which are talked about in the bible so there are good human values but subsequent generations what they found was that there is not much philosophy in the bible per se and there was another tradition that was the greco roman tradition so primarily the greek philosophy the romans are a little were little bit more of kshatriya kind martial kind of people so eventually because both of them were more or less the same geographical area so many christian thinkers they tried to bring about a marriage of biblical ethical teachings with christian philosophy so one of the prominent one was augustine and he tried to integrate jesus with plato he was roughly in the 4th century and much later 11th century there was thomas aquinas and he tried to bring jesus teachings in touch with one of the students of plato who went completely against plato in many ways that's aristotle and most of modern christianity so these two in the many ways in which augustine and aquinas are they are different but most of modern christianity is actually shaped by aquinas so this idea that there are three kinds of souls and the implications of that that doesn't come directly from jesus that comes from thomas aquinas this is a little technical but since you brought this point the, the bible itself has much more ethical teachings than philosophical teachings uh, so the nature of reality is not talked about much and trying to in trying to fill that void many things were brought in from the contemporary philosophy present at that time but when from the ethical teachings and life stories it was more centered around the heart more centered around personal development more centered around personal growth and and connection to god yes of course no doubt about that yes sir at the center the idea of love of god and love of all living beings in relationship with god that was central to jesus teachings and that's why we have that celebrated concluding teaching where he says that forgive them for they know not what they do even when those who are trying to crucify him kill him he was forgiving towards them so that level of consciousness of you know you know forgive them for they not for they not know what they do that is also a very big part of the bhakti philosophy yes i mean we see all the saints in the line of bhakti who are constantly uh, praying and seeking uh, for others well-being and this making sure that that everyone in this world is peaceful and happy in the life of haridas thakur who is one of my favorite characters i mean he is has a very similar characteristics of of circumstances as jesus 
where he's being dragged through the through the marketplaces and whipped and caned and similar to Jesus. And he is begging for the life and he is seeing how to serve the people who are tormenting him. So I find that there is tremendous amount of uh, similarities between the teachings of the direct teachings in the life of Jesus and uh, the saints in the Vaishnava lineage. Yes, the ethical teachings definitely. Well, ethical and directly the spiritual focus, there's a lot of similarity. With respect to philosophy, there is significant amount of differences. Yes, yes. I Would think it be we, fair to say like, oh, sorry, Vita, sir. I think we're going a little bit, uh, a little detour, but but regardless. More than a little detour, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rather, maybe you're not Just saying, much would it be fair to say, like, in Christianity, you go to heaven or hell? Would it, would it be fair to say, like, we ha also have heavenly planets and are we kind of view the same, except it's we have more like fine granularity in the different in the soul's journey? Yeah, it's a very good question. I'll try to answer briefly. So, you know, sometimes we equate the idea of the soul with spirituality. Hmm? As soon as you accept the soul, you will be spiritual. But it's not that simple. We could make it uh, four kinds of, so there is a spiritual worldview, there is a material worldview. And then there is, broadly you can say, afterlife. Afterlife is, there is something after this life. So, and then there is no afterlife. So, it is not necessary that just because somebody accepts a soul, that they will automatically have a spiritual worldview. So now, this is no afterlife and materialistic worldview, this is simply materialism. Where this life is all that you have, you live and you die. But there can be an afterlife with a materialistic worldview. So, what does that mean? Like you say, in some, some denominations or some religious traditions, their idea is that you go to paradise. And what is there in paradise? Oh, there is honey to drink and there are virgins to enjoy with. And it's almost like the divine is an afterthought. So there is another lifetime, but the, another, the life is full of materialism. So it is more like this is religious materialism. So just because somebody accepts the idea of a, like, afterlife and somebody accepts the idea of a soul, that does not necessarily make them spiritual. Because you may accept the idea of a soul, but that is just an idea so that accepted to continue our existence in the next life. And in the next life, there is, there is pleasure, which is essentially materialistic pleasure. So in this vision of the cosmos, this is the earth. And in some ways, there is a heaven above. And our body dies. You can call it heaven, you can call it paradise, whatever name. But uh, our body dies here, but we have something similar to a body in this life, next life. And we continue enjoying in the same ways that we are enjoying here, but to greater degrees. So... This is religious materialism. This is not really spirituality. Spirituality, the difference is connection with source. Yes, it is a, not just a different degree of enjoyment. It is a different category of enjoyment. So, enjoyment in the spiritual domain does not necessarily depend on physical pleasures. Physical pleasures of, uh, of say... Sensory pleasures. Sensory pleasures. Yes. So, it's so more like relationship? Yes, the relationship is based on love. So... In this understanding, the in the this is the Bhagavad understanding broadly. Yes, there is heaven, there is earth, there is a lower which we'll discuss later about hell. But beyond this is the spiritual world. So all of these, you could say, all of these are a part of the material world. So even hell is even he heaven is a part of the material world. And the ultim ultimate spiritual realization is not going here. It is going here. So wait, what's the difference between earth, heaven, hell, and in this quadrant, 
to the quadrant below. If, if earth, heaven, and hell in this quadrant, in the material world quadrant, is in fact material world, then isn't that implying that there's sensory, pl sensory pleasures, pleasures dominate there? Yeah, even in the Gita's conception, heaven is a place of sensory pleasures, but heaven is not the place where one goes permanently. Then goes there and stays there for some time and comes back. It's almost like a resort. A person who earns a lot of money, then they want to go for a resort, go to enjoy to some resort. They stay there and as long as they have enough money, they can stay in the resort. So our good karma, we'll discuss more about karma in future. Our good karma is what enables us to go to heaven. But after that, this in itself back. is a very broad topic. We should discuss one day heaven, earth and hell. Because yeah, it's yeah. so beautiful and complex and, and, and interesting. But yes. I think one of our one of our discussions on this, I don't I don't mean to uh divert the topic, but we're also gonna cover the core beneath our ever changing, everlasting body and aspirations of the body. Yeah. Do we have time to discuss that today? It's mm -hmm. almost yeah. I think we might be close out of time, actually. But yeah. if, could you scroll back up to that line where you had consciousness? Consciousness. Where the line where consciousness was going up and you showed the transmigration of the soul. Okay. I here. feel like it, yeah, this really kind of summarizes 213. I, I feel like, in my understanding, it's like 213 is taking the vantage point of the consciousness. So, like that line. So, it's like saying that really what's happening to as our soul's journey our soul is constantly evolving and what's happening above that is showing what's happening within our bodily platform like where our soul is is living but it doesn't affect the consciousness like there's no blurps in the consciousness that's straight so if we can learn to see through the through the vantage point of the consciousness we won't be disturbed as our bodies are everly changing and our souls transmigrating is that is that a is that a correct understanding of 213 yes not only it's correct it's articulate beautifully put that the body is changing but the more we are fixed in our in our understanding of ourselves as consciousness then we will see that there is a core that is unchanging and not only can it stay unchanging but it can also be evolving that i can we can grow so this evolution of consciousness it's 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 in wisdom. We become wiser about the nature of reality and it is in our capacity to love. So what do wisdom is more in terms of perception and love is more in terms of action. What do we do? So that evolution happens. Both of these rise upwards. We can discuss about this more when we talk about how Bhakti brings about the evolution of consciousness. Okay. Can we Thank zoom you. back into the can we can we uh, uh, give us the overview what we covered? Sure. Please. Yeah, so I'll quickly summarize what we discussed today. So broadly, we started by discussing about the idea of a unchanging soul, that the unchanging below the changing, and that is what gives us unchanging soul below changing body, and that is what brings stability. A sense of security amidst the change. And that is what the 213 is telling us about in Bhagavad Gita. That was the keyword that we were discussing. And then in that connection, we discussed about how this is something which you can empirically observe. This the changing body is something in this life. Itself, we can change, see the changing body. And then that same thing happens beyond this life also. So that's where we discuss the ideas of transmigration and reincarnation. So this gives us a sense of stability even after death. And then we discussed about the conceptions of soul, how it just doesn't exist, that leads to materialism. And it exists only in only in connection with the body. That leads that is the Abrahamic idea that also has several logical problems, which we mentioned. And then the idea is the soul. The, health, the most vibrant, the most robust understanding it, it exists through the body. Not, it is not, not that it doesn't exist, not that it exists only as the body. It exists through the body and in that sense, the body is a vehicle. Its vehicle can change over time. 
and then the last part i discussed was that how the conception of the soul and the world view how they are related discuss the four quadrants so especially this is the fourth quadrant where they we accept the idea of a soul and afterlife and then we also accept a spiritual world view so that cosmology where there is a destination even beyond heaven because here at the if we are thinking that the afterlife is going to be filled with bodily pleasures then we are not really gone beyond the bodily conception to a spiritual conception of life so this is where the gita takes arjuna where arjuna said that you are concerned about the physical welfare of others but actually the physical welfare is important but much more important is the spiritual welfare and that is what the gita will guide arjuna towards beautiful thank you